little country is full of some of the most wonderful things. Hogs pudding, chin kicking, straw bears, cullen skink, to name but a few. Now, you might not know what all those are, and therein lies the problem, because some of them are in danger of disappearing. So I'm on a mission to seek them all out before it's too late. In today's show... <laughs> there's something fishy going on down the market. There's fish altogether quite an aphrodisiac. Yeah, it, is, it is an aphrodisiac. Has it, has it been serving you well? Well, I've got 12 children. Have oh, yeah. you? It's bottoms up at the rubber dub. Am I in the Navy now? Yeah. <laughs> and from the kitchen in my caravan... This is what they used to use in Victorian times. I cook up a traditional dish for a right royal bunch. Ain't half bad, actually. Yeah. Better than I thought it would be. Well, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> if I was to have a bull and row on the apples and pears with the bag for life, because I'd forgotten to take me daisy roots off, you'd probably think I'd hurt my head. But if you were a Cockney, born within the sound of Bow Bells, you'd know exactly what I mean. And if you think Cockney rhyming slang is the only thing the East End has ever given us, well, don't be so fore and aft. Grab yourself a nice cup of Rosie Lee and have a butcher's hook at this lot. I've seen no idea what I'm saying. It's complete gibberish. Today, I'm in the big smoke, London. But it's the east end of the city that I'm exploring. Home of the Cockneys. Famous for their rhyming slang and jelly deals. Londoners born within the sound of Bow Bells became known as Cockneys way back in the 14th century, when country folk described working-class Londoners as cock's eggs, meaning people they didn't trust. The name stuck and it wasn't long before EastEnders adopted the Cockney name with pride. From its bustling docks to pie and mash shops, barrow boys to pearly queens, London's East End has a strong sense of culture and identity that's made it stand apart from the rest of the city. Oh, looks like they found me. Quick duck. Nowadays, it might be home to artists, wine bars and trendy markets, but the traditional East End is still very much alive. For many, this is the real heart of London, and I can't wait to find out more, so I'm going to hit the frog and toad. That's the road, obviously, see, it rhymes. Frog and toad, road. That's how it works. In the early hours of the morning, in the shadow of the towers of Canary Wharf, where thieves and swindlers gamble with our savings, the yells of the honest fishmonger combine with the smell of the sea to kickstart the morning in the East End. And they do start early. Ooh, I have a little bow pee pee. I made that last one up myself. Nine hundred years ago, Billingsgate Wharf was a sprawling marketplace, selling all kinds of goods to warm a Cockney's cockles. It became a seafood mecca in the 16th century, and soon after, the largest fish market in the world. Today, the market's moved a few miles up the road into modern premises, but it's still the hub of London's fish industry, with the same families supplying freshly caught fish to the local restaurants and eels to the pie and mash shops. I mean, don't forget to keep count exactly how many you've had. Fishmonger Roger Barton and his family have been trading here for generations. £34 for the lady. Hey, Roger. How are you? How do you do? It's good to see you. 
So yeah. you like fish aid? I do, I love a bit of fish. So do I, you can't yeah. read it. It's lovely. How long have you been working in Billings? 51 game? years. I started for a firm called WH Boston. Yeah. We used to serve the Queen. Did you? Yep. Did she come down the market? Uh, well, if she did, she was in disguise. <laughs> and she loved her fish, though. Yeah. Um, and I used to sometimes, as a shop boy, would bite from there to Windsor on the bite. Right. It's a long time what ago. What did she have? A couple of fish fingers? Dover soles. She? she was a Dover sole lady. Yeah. And you know, I they love it. I yeah. mean, look, there's the old Dover soles, look. You can't beat them. Probably, a, might even be too fresh to eat. Yeah. One of the only fish that you can eat too fresh. How's Mackerel, that? herrings, what, too, too soft? No, it'll eat, it'll eat hard. All it right. will eat hard. Hold on one minute, eh? Yeah, this could sure. be something important. Could be the Queen. Hello? <laughs> yes, what would you like? There are over a hundred fishmonger families competing here to get the best price for their catch. <laughs> and the daily banter is as much a part of their jobs as filleting a Dover sole. Most of their fish is sold wholesale, but if you're willing to get out of bed early, the doors are open to any of us. <laughs> but you've got to arrive before dawn to catch the freshest fish, some of it caught right on the doorstep. Do you get much out of the Thames? Yes, we do. A lot more than we used to. What have you got out of the Thames then? Because right. I, we get I had, I, you know, the Thames was a dead river not yeah, a long time ago. If you go ago, down the it? south end now, there's about 17 seals. Yeah. That is a great indication that there's fish there for them to eat. Yeah. 30, 40 years ago, you wouldn't get them. But now you do. It's cleaned up and fantastic. Whiting, sprats, Dover sole, a lot of Dover soles, bass, flounders, dabs. But it's not just locally caught seafood that Roger sells. Nowadays, he's got fish that's been reeled in from all corners of the world. What have you got on here, then? Pollock aid, sword loin, barracuda, scallop meat, turbot. Yeah. Michael, would you like to tell aid what they are? It's a more rabbit fish, sir. It's a what? Rabbit fish. Rabbit, rabbit fish. fish? It's yes. a rabbit fish. <laughs> Where does it from? come from? It's come from Indian Ocean, sir. Has it? Yes, sir. Do you have Love to know every fish. kind of fish there is? Yeah, yeah he knows all his fish. Yeah. He's very good, Michael. How many fish do you say? What kind of different types of fish, kinds you sell of fish over there? Yeah. I could serve you a different fish 365 days of the year. Could you? Yeah, you could have a different fish. Well, I like them all. You love them all. <laughs> and they've all got their own taste. They're yeah. all individuals. You'll love these shrimps, though. You'll yeah. have to take some of them. They're fabulous. I love shrimps. Very good for love making, they tell me. Are they? Yes. This fish altogether quite an aphrodisiac. Yeah, it is, it is an aphrodisiac. Has it, has it been serving you well? Well, I've got 12 children. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> and my dad had 13, so Good. I'm still going. Yeah. Still trying to break the record. So what have you got that we could just cook up in, the, in, the, in my kitchen? Right, what we'd like to cook up today, I would think... Morning, Ronnie. Thanks, Ron. Um, I think will be some nice grey mullet from the Thames. Yeah. Will you fill it a bit for us? Yes, if you want me oh, to. Oh, fantastic. OK. Cheers, man. Leave it to me. <laughs> Here we are, then. Here's our grey mullet. Here's our grey mullet, aid. And as you can see, I've nearly filleted them right the way through, and I'm now just going to finish them off. And as you can see, look, the flesh is lovely and white, aid, Isn't it beautiful? This is guaranteed to put hairs on your chest, aid. <laughs> Did you know that the grey mullet is a bottom feeder? No, not that sort of bottom. I mean, it hunts for food along the river bed. You might only get one in there. You might just cut that in half. Yes. Well, we cut this one in half. That'll go round the sides, eh? Yeah. Got smelling lovely already. Are you married, eh? I am. Yeah, been married oh, well, twenty. Have to be the way you cook, Twenty-six eh, years or something there. Yeah. Lovely. Good luck to you, eh? Late start. Only, right, only, see. only three children. Only three? Well, you're yeah. doing marvellous, eh? <laughs> you eat that fish, I guarantee you'll have a fourth on the way within a month. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we try that? There you go, sir. Merci, monsieur. That off. Now, let's have a taste of this Thames Grey Moulet. Grey Moulet? Grey Moulet. <laughs> nice. That's nice. my breakfast. That's lovely. And you haven't overcooked it, Aid. That's the wonderful part about That's it. It's very tasty, isn't it? It's lovely. A very full flavoured kind of fish, it's isn't lovely. it? Lovely, it's firm. Quite strong. Yep. That's fantastic, Roger. Thank you very much lovely. for showing me round. 
I, it's been an honour to meet you. You're more than welcome. Please come again. Bring all your colleagues, and we'll feed you again. Thank you very it's much. It's lovely, and it's been an honour to meet you. Thank you. May you go far afield and learn more and more. <laughs> God bless you. Thanks very much, and see you soon. All right, and thanks on. for the milk. Nice <laughs> breakfast. Bye. <laughs> right. So I'm just going to take a, a little um, snap from my scrapbook. Good luck to you. Uh, if you could hold it up a bit so it's nearer your head, because I'll get it in. Go on, Sam, go. In you go. Is that the best view of the fish? That's a beauty, eh, doesn't it? Lift it up a bit. It looks better looking than I am. <laughs> lovely fish. All right. Cheers, man. Lovely fish. Get out of the way. What are you doing coming out? Not even signalling. Hmm? Coming up, I get ready to do battle. It's a fun fight, quite literally. <laughs> and with my caravan in tow, my cooking skills will be put to the test. Look at that. Looking very nice. I'm travelling round Britain with my rather cute caravan, discovering foods and traditions that are being passionately preserved. Today, I'm in London's East End, where I've muscled my way into a seafood palace. Hold on one minute, yeah, there's sure. going to be something important. Could be the Queen. Hello. Next, it's all hands on deck for a very unique Cockney celebration. In Bow, in the East End, an age-old tradition takes place every Good Friday at the Widow's Son pub. It involves hot cross buns, sailors and lots of rum. Sounds like my kind of party. But first, I'm off to Mr Bun's bakery to make some of my very own buns. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot Cross buns. During the 19th century, London was the hot cross bun capital of Britain. Street sellers sold them for a penny, and bakers competed to make their buns the best in town. Traditionally eaten on Good Friday, these buns are steeped in superstition. The cross on the top was said to ward off evil spirits, and if you bake them really hard and they don't go mouldy, you've got yourself a lucky charm. In the East End of London, super-sized hot cross buns take centre stage in a traditional annual ceremony, and I've been tasked with the job of making them. So I've come along to an old East End bakery where Andrew Snow, AKA Mr Bun, has been making buns for decades. Mr Bun. Hey, how nice you do? You. Nice to meet you. And you, sir, and you. You're not really Mr Bun, are you? Are no, you? I'm not Mr Bun. Mr Mr. Snow. Mr Snow. Mr Snow, I'm going to call you Mr and Mrs Bun. And your daughter's here as well, isn't she? Oh, uh, we have, yes, a, we have a baby bun somewhere. Baby this bun? This is oh, our baby daughter, bun. Molly. Hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Miss Bun. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, so we're here to do hot cross yeah. buns. Here we are. <laughs> now I've met the delightful buns, it's time for us to make some scrumptious ones. Mr Bun follows an old family recipe that he's been using for 23 years. This is how long it's been up here, look. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the, that's the time-honoured recipe. Has that come down from medieval uh, times, that bit of paper? A bit of like paper it. looks like it has. <laughs> <laughs> that's how long it's been here. Yeah. So, OK, we've got a 12, so 9, 10, 12. The first job is to make some bread dough but it's the special blend of spices that turns bread buns into the hot cross variety. <laughs> get, get your nose in there. Oh, that's fantastic. That's like... That's superb, isn't it? That is the smell of hot cross buns, that's isn't it? That's the smell of hot cross buns. And you see is how it, the is there cinnamon in there, is that...? I think, yeah, it's a liquid cinnamon in there. I so say we put lemon juice in it. We've soaked it overnight. The fruit's yeah. all soft now. And we've basically got and now we've raisins and sultanas Raisins and sultanas, yeah. Mm. Yeah, in there. We are very generous. In goes the spiced fruit and mix. 
Now for the best bit, getting me hands dirty. So you get your hands like this, yeah. one behind, and basically you're pushing in with your, with your thumbs, against your thumbs. Get your thumbs All in right. the middle, that's it. You see it going round? Yeah. And you should be getting a nice, tight, firm skin on the top without putting your fingers through the other side. All right. The kneading stretches out the dough so the yeast can do its job. Without it, my buns won't rise. Being good with your hands is a proud baking tradition. Come from this direction. Right. To the top, just gently moulding it in. Must be gentle with them. That's why the girls love it. All right. See? Oh, I shall do this to Jennifer as soon as I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she'll appreciate it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she will. <laughs> Tony, we'll just get on the table. I'm just going to give you a mould. <laughs> These need to be double in size, so to give the yeast a chance to do its job, the dough is left to rest. What next? What next? Mold them up. All right. Get them on trays. Forty minutes later, and it's time to shape my ceremonial buns. Yeah, looks good to me. That one go there, and that one can go there. Get a bit of a push. A bit of a push. And they're going in the prover. They'll be in the prover. About 40 minutes. All right, just to rise up a bit. Just to rise up. And then we'll have you piping them up. OK. So now what? Everyone's walking around with purpose. <laughs> but this is what bakers do. <laughs> we do a lot of walking around. We do a lot of walking around. <laughs> oh, I've just got to get the... Uh, oh, i just got to look in here. Uh, uh, my... Just in there. Mm, sausages. <laughs> yes. Ooh, sausages. Oh. Sausage. Oh. Sausage. 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 <laughs> you won't go hungry. Nicely risen. Nicely risen. Proved up. OK, how good are your piping skills? Proved them buns. I don't really know. The crosses are made out of a flour and water paste. Push. Easy to pipe. Push well, so you'd Push. think. Put it down. Oh, my God, what have you done? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. Push, push, keep pushing, keep pushing. It's not bad, not bad. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Just keep swimming. Gotcha. I told you it's like piping elastic bands, isn't oh, it? Oh, blimey. Keep going. Keep That's going. really annoying. I don't know who's getting more cross here, me or the bun. Yeah, you keep saying flick it back over and they'll go. It won't. It does. <laughs> it doesn't. Look, it just forms a huge line. It's your finger. <laughs> I've got the other... I'll use my finger. Right. Oh, oh, you ruined it. Oh. That was your fault, yeah. that one. OK, these are going straight in. <clears throat> Which Oven one? number two. Oh, it's nice and warm in there, isn't it? And we'll put those in the middle. That's my buns in the oven. We're charging extra for these ones. But this next batch is for sale in Mr Bun's shop. And I'm starting to get a bit hot under the collar. Oh, I've never been so nervous. <laughs> You're nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Pressurised. <laughs> I'm really nervous. <laughs> I've got to sell these. I know. That's, that's, what's, that's what's hurting me. Which you, one? Uh, you know the notion around goes hot cross buns, that's hot it. cross buns. One a penny. One a penny, well, don't two tell a penny. That. Don't tell them that. You think, well, we charge a bit he's, more a these days. he's a stupid baker, isn't he? <laughs> you can either get one for a penny or two for a penny. Well, I'll have two for I'll a penny. Two. Well, they do that. It's called a bog off now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I did all of them. Look at you that. You did. We're going to. Great for me. Fantastic. Look! Look no, at that! Look at that! Oh, oh, look! Oh, look! Oh, look! Oh, your finger in it now. <laughs> OK, let's check yeah. out... Let's check out your buns, shall we? Who are? <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. Not bad, chef. Oh, lovely. I bet they taste as good as they look. <laughs> but these ones aren't for eating. Got me buns. Oh. Plank click every trip. And off we go. Next stop, the pub. <laughs> I'm on my way to meet some sailors that are keeping a 150 year old tradition alive. Known to the locals as Bun Day, it's one of the oldest events in the East End, and it takes place here at the Widow's Son Pub in Bow. On this spot, there used to be a cottage belonging to a widow. Her son was serving in the Navy. 
and one Good Friday, eagerly awaiting his return, she baked a batch of hot cross buns. But sadly, he never came home. Right. I'm looking for Erica. Do you know who... Did you make them? I did, actually. <laughs> no, I blooming well did. I, I actually you. made them. How? I went, I went to Mr Buns the Baker's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's his name. I know it sounds implausible, but it's true. Erica. Landlady Erica Turner is in charge of this year's proceedings, and she's got the full story. Every year on the day that he was you expecting home, home, she, she had another bun and hung it in the window. Oh. So it might have been in the hope that he might return one day, but yeah. she did it religiously until the day she died. All right. And when the pub was built, they named it after her, like the widow and her son. Yeah. It's called the widow's son. And every landlord that's been here has carried on the tradition. All right. A net of hot cross buns hangs above the bar, and every Good Friday, a sailor adds another bun to the collection. And this year, it'll be a bun that I've baked that'll take pride of place in the ceremony. All I need now is someone to put the bun in the net. Hi, darling. Hello. What's your name? Nicola. Nicola. I should say darling to a, to a naval person. <laughs> Hello, Captain Darling. Um, you're, you're, you've been chosen to, to put the bun in this year? I have, yes. Because you're the youngest in the, in the squadron? I think it's because I'm the youngest and probably the lightest That's as well. a, yeah, probably a good idea. And have you been down to this kind of bun fight before? I haven't. This is my first year, so right. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, we're going to move on and chat to her around. Come around this way. Nicola's new to all this, but some of these sailors have been coming here for years. What does it mean to, to everyone? Does it... Me personally, it's, yeah. um, I'm keeping the tradition alive. Yeah. I like coming down here because I know a lot of the people and to join in that good time. That sounds like one. Let me buy you a drink. <laughs> We've raised the bun, now to raise our glasses. Rum has been a naval tradition since the 17th century, when British ships sailed to the Caribbean and a tot of rum became part of the sailors' daily ration. Right, has everyone got a rum? And what I'd like to do before we up spirits is to say it's great to be here, and, but there are people that aren't here and we miss, and for our absent friends, Royal Navy, up spirits. Yo! Good man. Uh, am I in the Navy now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Join your name. <laughs> That's it. Good mate. Right, in. What a great way to spend an afternoon. Not only have I been entertained by a fun bunch keeping up an old tradition, but I've found out the miraculous qualities of hot cross buns are endless. Apparently some young maidens, they used to, with a pin prick, you know, just kind of make the date in the bottom of them. And they keep them in their drawer with their um, perishables. And um, it meant if they could keep it for a year and it didn't go off, then they'd get married the next year. That's quite nice. Another one I really like is that you keep it, and if ever anyone got ill, you just give them a little bit, cut a little bit off, and give them a bit of a hot cross bun. And it would have magical powers, and you would get better or die. Coming up next, you won't Adam and Eve it, but I try a Cockney delicacy for the very first time. It's a culinary sensation. Mm. It is, actually. Mm. I'll be cooking up a delicious dish for East End royalty. <laughs> well, we were going to say, please, sir, can we have some more? There you go. <laughs> and if you can't wait for details, you can go online to... I I'm journeying round Britain, tracking down traditions and customs. Today, I'm in East London, where my taste buds have been tickled 
That's my oh. breakfast. And my steady hand has been put to the test. I've never been so nervous. Now, though, I'm off to tuck into a dish that's been flogged on these East End streets for centuries. All right. Be lucky. Hang on. Ooh. I think I put the wrong Pirates of Penzance on this morning. Now, a dish that is synonymous with the East End is pie and mash with eels and liquor. Now, I'm very ashamed to say I've never had it before. Time to put that right. Pie and mash shops have been feeding Cockney since the 18th century. Back then, the River Thames was filthy, and the only fish worth catching were eels. Cheap and nutritious, cooked eels became very popular indeed. Today, there are species in trouble. Numbers have fallen by a third. Prices have shot up, and they've become quite a delicacy. Eels are no longer caught locally, but they're still very much on the menu in the East End. Stewed and served with meat pies, mashed potato and lashings of thick parsley gravy, known to the locals as liquor. The Goddard family have been dishing up this classic Cockney grub for more than a hundred years. And I'm hoping brothers Jeff and Kane will let me taste their wares. Are you the Goddard boys? We are, we are indeed, yeah. Yeah. You are. You're yeah. you're Jeff. I am Jeff. Jeff and Kane. Kane. Nice to meet you. Now, guys have been around for years. What, what, when did they suddenly get put together with mash? When when did the pie and mash thing happen? I think I think to be fair, you're probably looking at about the the, the late 1800s. Yeah. I mean, you know, you got to remember pies. You back then you could put almost anything in a pie. Yeah. You know. Wrapped in paper. Yeah, there was, there was no health and safety. No <laughs> health and safety, exactly. You well, know. Some people must have got very ill in those days. Yeah, I, I think they probably did, actually. <laughs> I mean, hence why we use the chilli vinegar yeah. um, as a tradition now with the food, because back then, the chilli, the vinegar, yeah. took away, the obviously... Disguise. Some disguise the rancid things, meat, right? yeah. yeah. It was a very simple, rustic London yeah. meal. Was so. it always served on a plate, then, pie and mash? Yeah, I think so. In a bowl, kind of a plate right, yeah. bowl, so that, you know, you could get the pie, the mash on there, and obviously the, um, the, the sauce that went on top, which yeah. is known as the liquor. Yeah, the liquor. This is, this mm. is something that intrigues me. So I don't, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It's the family secret, that well, is. Well, I, I can imagine it's a secret, but basically what is liquor? It's a sauce that goes over the, the eels, yeah. and it's made from when you stew the eels, you yeah. strain all the eels off, and then that stewing stock yeah. forms what the basis of the liquor is, yeah. and then you make up a parsley sauce from it, yeah. like people get when they have like cod and with a, like, yeah. a bit of parsley sauce over it. But this has now got the eel flavour in it, and um, people had it over the eels, but of course people like to have the hot eels with their pies, so it sort of evolved where you've got the the liquor going over the pies as well as the eels. <laughs> so now, now you're having your pie and your mash yeah. with eels. That's yes. right, yeah. And yeah. You've got meat on the plate yeah. and you've got fish on the plate together. Surf but, and turf. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, the original <laughs> surf and turf. Yeah. And it is a really nice combination. Well, should we go and make some? Yes. I think we should. Let's go to yeah. it. Let's yeah. go and make some. Come on, <laughs> you show me where. The pie and mash bit is pretty straightforward. I'm more interested in finding out what the boys do with the eels. So what have we got here? Right, what we've got here is the eels. It's fresh. Uh, I've just gutted it to make it easier for ourselves. Yeah. All we've got to do now is chop it up and hopefully chop them up into sort of pieces this size, yeah. bite-sized pieces, uh, and then we can stew them. Okay. Don't chop your fingers off. Which... Ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Nearly there. Put some force behind it. Mm, blimey, they are a bit tough. Use some elbow grease. Oh, he's rubbish. Who is he? Oh, it's me. Uh, that's it. Yeah, Good stuff. They're, right. they're nice pieces. Oh, 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 oh. Chopped up many an eel. <laughs> Goddards no longer rely on the Thames to supply their eels. Instead, they're imported from abroad. So you know what makes your hands a bit slimy, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah. Just be careful you don't splash yourself. Good stuff. Quick stir. This is going to form the basis of the liquor. That's yes. correct, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. And you can yeah. see immediately, I mean, it's yeah. just kind of... Yeah. yeah. Almost goes cloudy, doesn't yeah. it? Straight away. Yeah. yeah. Almost dried bay leaves in yeah. there. A drop of vinegar as well, just to bring the flavour out, isn't it? Yeah. Drop? Blimey. Well, you know. Yeah, I'll <laughs> yeah, I'd like to put a little... Not too much, yeah. because it'll burn it, but just a little bit of chilli. Yeah. All right, just a couple of little bits of chilli. And that's probably... Probably just do it that will for yeah. now. 
Okay, we'll leave some of the stewing stock behind. I want to know how we make the liquor, because this <laughs> is going to turn into this, isn't it? Now, there is some ingredients that we add to this. Our family recipe, which has yeah. been handed down to us from generation to generation. And how many people know it? Living yeah. in our family. Yeah. Only uh, me and my brother yeah. and our wives, only once to become our wives, though. Yeah. What happens but if you get so. divorced? Does, does she have to die? Uh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> you better stay married to him. <laughs> I can't persuade the Goddard boys to give anything away. And who can blame them? It's the secret ingredients that give their liquor its unique flavour. So there we got our liquor. Yes, yeah. our liquor. Now we've got to go and put the pies in. That's it, exactly. Right. Should we go and do that? We're going to do that now. All right. Cheers. We're going to stick into the middle oven so you can whack that in there. They make everything by hand here, including their minced beef pies and mashed potato. Right. Time to get stuck in. Make sure you do your, your one first, Jeff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> it's a god old boy's yeah. way. Oh, yeah. Survival of <laughs> the fittest round here. <laughs> Got to have the liquor all over the mash, keep it nice and hot. Right. Over right. the eels, and we tend to, tend to put half over half of the pie. Right. Okay? Here we go. It's, um, it's a culinary sensation. Mm. It is, actually. Mm. Mm. And it is, and it is important to know that this is the heartthrob of London. This is what London grew up on. Yeah. It's not fish and chips. It's not burgers. Pie and mash is the very heart of London. I think it's a fantastic establishment. I think the food is just delicious. And long may it continue. Thank you very, very much. No problem. For showing me. Very I shall pleasure having you down. I shall be coming quite regularly. Good. I hope so. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Right, I'm just going to take a little um, snapshot from my uh, yep. scrapbook. Can you hold the pies up a bit? Because I want to get everything in frame at once. Tilt them a little bit without dropping them. All the family run business in the background. And you even look like you like each other then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you get on? Yeah. Oh, we, we've had our moments. <laughs> we've had our moments. <laughs> we've, we've had a few. We've had a few follies I've out I've in the kitchen. I've chucked a few spuds at him. Yeah, fisticuffs. <laughs> uh, no, no, not, no. not as a fisticuffs. I, we have, he has thrown the odd knife and we have... I've, <laughs> yeah. I've, not fisticuffs, but he has thrown the I've odd knife. I've had a pot of peas that I've gone... Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For centuries, the London Docklands were the first stop for immigrants arriving in Britain, with many settling in the East End. Today, is the heart of London's Bangladeshi community and famous for a good old plate of Ruby Murray. But going back generations, this was home to thousands of Jews who fled Eastern Europe, bringing with them a Jewish staple that's become a Cockney tradition. What's the kind of best bagel to have? What's the uh, most popular? Salt beef is the popular one, or salmon and cream cheese. Well, I better, I better have a salt beef bagel. Do you like then, salt beef? I? Do you like yeah. mustard? Yes, please. Salt beef is rooted in Jewish tradition. To be kosher, meat has to be cooked within a few days of butchering. Without time to hang and tenderize, salting and slow cooking is the best way to turn a tough cut into a melt-in-the-mouth delicacy. That's a lovely looking Thank beef, isn't it? I enjoy it. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. Fast food, East End style. There we are. Bacon. Look at that salt beef. Absolutely delicious looking. Mm. It's one of the nicest takeaways you can get. You don't always have to eat American. Coming up next, I cook up a London classic from the back of my caravan. There very high in protein and exceptionally high in fibre. You know what I'm talking about. And swap my cap for a crown. Oh, you oh, 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 <laughs> I'm on a journey across our country to find the foods and traditions that make Britain, well, British. 
Today, I'm in the East End of London, where the people have been a bit friendly than the fish. That looks vicious, doesn't it, that? It is vicious. And I got into a stew over some eels. Ah! <laughs> now, I'm about to roll up my sleeves and cook up a hearty meal in this East London park for some lucky locals who are happy to sing for their supper. The style and the culture of ordinary working people are at the heart of most of our traditions. And perhaps nothing illustrates that better than the pearly kings and queens of London. And they ain't half bad at knocking out a good old sing along either. Take it away, Your Majesties. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I love London so. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I think of her wherever I go. Excellent, excellent work. And I tell you what I particularly liked about that was that you, John, were singing in a different key. Yeah, he almost does. Does he? Yeah. Is, yeah. It, is that a traditional no, thing? No, no, no. Very, depending on me. He? Tell me, what are, what are the pearly kings and queens? Because we've all seen them, but I don't think everyone knows exactly what, what, what you're for and where you come from. You well, know. we're a London tradition. Yeah. Which goes back 1865, the first pearly... This born, is Henry Croft. Henry Croft. Yeah. And he was born in a Victorian workhouse orphanage in Somers Town, in King's yeah. Cross. And he started doing the markets. And they used to have buttons on their lapels, down their trousers, on their hats, big yeah. penny buttons. And the more flashy... They were called flashes. Yeah. And the more flashes you had, the more customers, more customers you got. get. Yeah. And that's where the old saying flash alley comes from. All right, I see. Yeah. Henry Croft wanted to make himself flashier than all the other market traders, so covered his whole suit in pearl buttons. Henry's aim was to attract attention, to raise money for the orphanage where he grew up. And uh, he did so well that other charities, like hospitals, because there was no national health then, was there? Yeah. So uh, hospitals relied on charity. Yeah. And at the time, there were 28 London boroughs, and he made a pearly family up for each borough. You're, you're here for raising money for charity? Well, that's, that's what the pearly what kings and queens that do. That is what we do. We're all from one family. That's a very nice hat you've got there. So oh, we go. God, be a devil. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh that's 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 There you go, darling. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Right, look, I'll give you a hat back. And I'll let you oh. lot have a sit down and I'll make you some soup. Thank you very much. So I'll see you in a minute. Thank you. Cheers. Right, what I'm going to make is called a London Particular, uh, which is a type of pea soup named after the London fogs, which were called pea soupers. Um, they were very thick. So I'm just going to chop up some carrots in my semi-professional way, just to prove that anyone can do it. First of all, chop some veg. Carrots, onion and celery. And put a bit of oil in the pan. And put my veg in there. <clears throat> I have to say, it's the start of most soups, this, isn't it? Bit of onion, bit of carrot. Put the lid on that. Just going to let that sweat down for a minute. Um, Peas, split peas, are a fantastic thing. Um, these I've soaked overnight, um, but they obviously come in dried form. And they're a way of kind of keeping peas throughout the year, you know, so you don't have them, you know, not just when they're fresh. And they're very high in protein, are very low in fat, and exceptionally high in fibre. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's very good for you. Very good for the digestive system. <clears throat> and it wouldn't be pea soup without the peas, so in they go. Add some water, and if you're worried about amounts, the recipe's coming up later. This is ham bone, which is going to give us all the flavour. It's a very nice, cheap thing. Don't give it to the dog, put it in a soup. 
Dickens gave the pea soup of fogs a, a bit of a mention in um, Bleak House. There's a scene with um, Esther Summerson, the, the heroine, and she's walking through the streets with Mr Guppy, the lawyer, and um, she remarks on the fact that they can hardly see where they're going because the, she says, is there a big fire somewhere? Because, you know, what's, what's all this smoke? He says, oh, no, miss, this is a London particular. And that's where the name for this soup comes from. I'm a mine of information, aren't I, about pea soup? You thought there was nothing in it. Just peas, no. All of history is in this dish. <laughs> a lot of birds in this park. I feel a song coming on. Feed the birds, the birds. Mm, that's enough of that. Right, what I'm going to do just now, because uh, we're nearly there, is uh, I'm just going to fry off. I've just cut these bits of bacon up. So I'm going to use, I'm just going to put them on top afterwards. That's just something to crunch into, you know. There's nothing more tricky than separating your bacon bits. I had a penny for each time I'd separated my bit, bacon, bit of the, my bacony bits. I'll do with something to eat. <laughs> I'm getting a bit, getting a bit taters in the mould sitting over here. Bit of a what? Bit taters in the mould sitting over here. Taters in the no, you have to translate that one. Taters in the mould, cold. All oh, right. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Here it is. Look at that. Looking very nice. Now I'm going to remove the bone. Ooh, don't fall off now. There we go. Yeah, that's for you. I'm going to have the soup. <laughs> right, now, this is what they used to use in Victorian times. Um, let's put this in here. Have a look in here. You can play the blending part by ear, really. I like my soup a bit chunky. And finally, pour in some cream. This makes it rather rich. Unctuous. Oh, that looks lovely. Oh, look at that. There we have a London particular with bacon -y bits. Last bit of bacony bits on there. Time to feed some very hungry East Enders. There you go, John. Thanks, Hank. In good health. All right to eat it, is it? I hope so. Okay, now... I'll give this loopy loop a try. <laughs> and so will I. How's that? That ain't, that ain't half bad, actually. Yeah. Better than I thought it would be. Well, I thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? John thought it was a winner. If you too would like to impress your friends with this simple soup, this is how I did it. First, fry the chopped onion, carrots and celery in some oil for about five minutes. Add the split peas that have been soaked overnight, some water and the ham bone. You may need to pop down to your local butcher for that. Leave to simmer for an hour. Remove the bone and blend. Stir in some cream. Double cream makes it nice and thick. Fry some bacon until it's nice and crispy. The crispier the better. And sprinkle on top of your soup. You can find details of what you've seen in today's show at itv.com food. And there you go. A traditional London particular with bacony bits. Lovely. Now, well, throughout this programme, I've been taking the mickey out of uh, Cockney rhyming slang. Yeah. Um, what is Cockney rhyming slang for? Why, why, why was it invented? It created in order to confuse the customers and the police. The customers and the police? Oh, yeah. Confuse everybody? Oh, yeah. It was used normally in two-syllable words. For example, loaf of bread. Dead. Is head. Head. Right? Yeah. So if someone says, use your loaf... Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Only the recipient would know that the other half is yeah. bread, right, loaf of bread, yeah. so that's how it was used. Yeah. And it's been updated over the years. It's not something that remains constant. Yeah. So, for example... It seems a bit impure these days. There's quite a lot of new ones, aren't there? Yeah, that's exactly what... Like it, Wayne, Wayne Rooney for Loony. And Ruby, Ma like Ruby Murray for curry. Yeah. 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 See, when so, we finish here, I might take you over a ball of chalk, down a frog and toad, 
go around the jolly all and go in the old battle cruise and I'll buy you a pig there. Nice. Yeah. See? Yeah. Well, I understood that. Did you? Yeah. Well, tell you everybody what it meant. You're going to take me right down the road, down the corner to the pub and buy me a pint of beer. That's it. Got it in one. Well, look, I'm about to scarper. <laughs> down the frog and toe. Yeah. But before I do, will you sing us, all, or sing us another song? Mm. Well, we are we going to finish eating first? Yeah. Not? Finish eating and then sing us a song. When you go down Lambeth Way, any evening, any day, you'll find us all doing the Lambeth Walk. Oi! Well, that's it from the East End. I'm off down the rubber dub for a pig's ear. Or maybe a gold watch. See you next nickel and dime. You'll find us all doing the Lambeth Walk. <laughs>